making the second record was it was different than the first because all the songs from this new record are brand new within the last year or so. Uh, with the first record that I did, um, they were songs that I'd been doing forever. Uh, I'd written most of them by myself, but there were a couple that I'd done with uh, a friend of mine, Devin. And then there was also uh, a couple others that we got from from other songwriters as well. But the uh, the major difference between the two was just the amount of time that that kind of passed. You know, with with that first one, we actually I recorded it once, and uh, it was my first time in the studio and didn't really know what I was doing. I kind of put this record into the other people's hands that that were helping me record it and when it was all said and done it ended up not being the record that I wanted to uh, release and so we sat on it for a while released an EP in the meantime and then went back and re-recorded everything um, and so that was the uh, <clears throat> the major difference uh, with that one um, in, in the beginning uh, the the when I started the second one, I, the, we I already had one under my belt, so there was a lot of, a lot of things in the studio that I was more comfortable with. Uh, kind of felt like I knew more of what I wanted to do, uh, how I wanted things to sound. Um, but the coolest part about these, the second record, is just the uh, the songs that we've got on it. I, I co-wrote all of the songs, and so. <sighs> That's just a uh, you know kind of a cool thing uh, to to have as a as an artist a songwriter. I had a hand in, in making every single one of these songs on my record, so it's very very personal, uh, and I think it turned out really well. I'm very very happy with with the way that it came together. The first single we did is "Dance All Around It," and it was actually. I think it was the the first song that I had written with Brent and Chris. It was one of the first songs that I wrote uh, after being signed up here at Seagale. And Chris, I think he had the idea for the hook, uh, dancing all around it. But the that we'd already kind of started writing the song before we came up with the title. The idea behind the song was just about a a guy that was uh, just wanting to you know, go have a drink about his problems. He was in a, in a relationship, I guess, with a, a girl, and they were out of, you know, kind of a crossroads. Hadn't broken up yet officially, but things weren't doing very well, and so he was just going to, you know, have a drink and mind his business, and of all the places in the world that she could have gone, she had to choose his bar and bring her new guy, and so it was... You know, not necessarily a personal story that I was telling about myself or that Brent or Chris was talking about then, but it's definitely something that we've heard of before. We have friends that have gone through it, and everybody's had their heart broken, and, you know, when you see your ex or current whatever with somebody else, it's always a, or it's never a good thing. So uh, that was uh, kind of the idea behind that song. Well, the idea from that one, actually, uh, Brent and I are, are big John Mayer fans, and on uh, John Mayer had a, a album, I think it was two albums ago, it's called Battle Studies, and uh, there was a song called Assassin on that, which is basically where he talks about a guy that is an assassin, he goes and, and hooks up with girls, and he's gone. He, he works it in the dead of night, and he's gone before the sun comes up. And so we just thought that was kind of a cool idea, and we wanted to revisit, I guess, not revisit that song, but kind of see if we could tell a similar story. And it's basically, you know, about a guy who, uh, that's what he does. He just, you know, he's a bit of a womanizer, um, and he hooks up, but then he finally meets his match and finds one that's like, you know, he, he's just going about business as usual, but then once uh, once the the sun comes up the next morning, he's like, finds himself not wanting to leave. Like, he's, he's, he's supposed to leave because that's what he does. I mean, he just does his work and then he's, he's gone. Uh, but after, uh, after spending the night with this one, he's, uh, 
he's like, you know, he's afraid he's, if he leaves now, he's never going to see her again. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where, where it comes into play. And then, you know, everybody's always talking about ruining their good reputation. We just put a little spin on that and talked about ruining his bad reputation. We wrote that one, uh, let's see, Brent and I wrote that with Frank Rogers, and that was actually on our uh, Seagull Writers Retreat last last year, and it was the first time that I'd written with Frank, which was really cool, and um, we were kind of, I don't know, we were batting around a few different ideas. The first hour or two, we didn't really know what we were going to write about. We were trying to think of something, and then we just decided to take a break and go down to the... Uh, refreshment uh, room and, and grab some some snacks and beverages and we came back with a bottle of Jack Daniels and uh, just for inspiration, you know, and we actually started looking at the bottle and there were some cool things on it, just, you know, little history tidbits about uh, about Jack Daniels and, uh, and then we kind of got on the subject, we had a, Brent had a title uh, title just a, a booklet that had a bunch of titles, and one of them was uh, wasting, uh, wasting whiskey or something about not wasting any, anything on on you. I don't know how it came about, but uh, we just started. We were like, all right, you know, we'll talk about how whiskey's made and and about good reasons to drink whiskey, and then bad reasons to drink whiskey, and then we just the wasting no more whiskey on you just kind of popped out and then we ran with it and we wrote this song in about I don't know half an hour it was it was cool like it's always nice when that inspiration strikes and you go from not having anything and just frustrated to a completed song and it just it kind of wrote itself you know uh it's a you know just a cool way to talk about how uh you know Whiskey can be a great thing, but it can also be a bad thing if you let it, and so we're just not letting it be a bad thing anymore. Only celebrate the good reasons to drink whiskey. <laughs> this song is kind of a song, it's, like, it's about the cycle of drinking in general. Like, uh, this is completely unrelated, but in uh, Austin Powers 3, I think, there's a character called Fat Bastard. And uh, he said, I'm unhappy because I eat, and I eat because I'm unhappy. <laughs> and that's just kind of how the, the song goes. Like, you drink to be happy, but then once you drink, you realize you're sad. And the story kind of unfolds as, as the uh, verses go. Uh, we, the, the Fat Bastard thing had nothing to do with the songwriting process. I just thought of that. thought it worked. But... <clears throat> um, so yeah, it tells a story about a guy who just wants to go drink a beer, but every time he drinks beer, he thinks about her, and then he thinks about her, and then he calls her, and then he calls her, and then she shows up, and then she shows up, and they hook up, and then they hook up, and she's gone, and that's kind of how, and then he's drinking again, you know, so it's like, every time he drinks, it's only good for the night, like, he either drowns his sorrows and forgets about it, or even worse... She'll meet up with him and uh, make him feel good for the night, but then when the morning comes, she's gone again, and then he's right back where he started. So that was uh, kind of the idea behind that one. It's just uh, the uh, the vicious cycle uh, of of drinking with 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 people sometimes, like with this guy in particular. Uh, this is another song that we we wrote on that retreat, uh, and I wrote it with. Uh, Jim Brown and Chris Dubois, and uh, it's kind of like a throwback country song. Like that was what we wanted uh, coming into this session. We when we were talking about songs we wanted to write, uh, Moose, as everybody calls him, uh, and and Chris and I were were just wanting to like you know write a song that uh, you know was was like the country songs that everybody loved back in the eighties. You know. Conway Twitty era, uh, 70s, 80s, and, um, it's like a, I don't know, kind of a slow jam, couple skate type of a song, and it's not, it's, it, do, it doesn't fit the theme for, 
Well, I, I won't say it doesn't fit the theme for the record. It doesn't follow along with a lot of the other songs on the record um, because it is a, you know, a, a sappy kind of love song. But I feel like a country record wouldn't be a country record without, you know, a couple of those type of songs on there. I mean, everybody wants to hear that from time to time. And uh, we really... Uh, uh, I think that that song it, it it works well for the album. Kind of breaks it up a little bit. Instead of hearing about heartbreak, you're hearing about love, and that's just it's re refreshing to people, reassuring that that it is possible to still uh, to still fall in love to a country song. <laughs> this this song started actually just because that was something that I said in conversation uh, with. With Chris and Brent, I, I know I've mentioned their names a bunch, but if you look at the back cover of this album, you're going to see their name a bunch because I, I think seven or so of the songs we, the three of us wrote. Uh, so, um, yeah, we were just in, in in a writing session one day, and somebody said something, and I was like, "Wow, well, you know, it was." I said, "Well, that's close enough for the girls I date," or something like that. I don't know how how it came up, but. As soon as I said it, they just like stopped and looked at each other and were like, what did you just say? <laughs> and so that's kind of how it started. And yeah, it's cool. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of truths in that. I mean, it's really about a, just a simple kind of guy. He's not like, you know, he's a small towns, a small town backwoods living dude. And that's, that's kind of what, uh, the, the type of girl he's looking for. He's not looking for a, a big city girl or, you know, yuppie girls as, as a, uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, damn it. Now that I'm thinking of it, Duck Dynasty, Phil Robertson. Yeah. She, she's, she's no yuppie girl from, uh, from this song, but yeah. And, and, uh, you know, he's just, just about a guy that's, that's a simple, simple dude looking for a simple woman. And, um, you know, just tells about how he likes to go fishing and eating barbecue and living on in a, off a dirt road and, you know, just enjoying the simple life. He, uh, the first time that, that I remember, the, the biggest memory that I have was when I was going into sixth grade, uh, I... Going into middle school, I was going to be in beginner band, and uh, we were trying to figure out which instrument I needed to play. And I think we settled on woodwinds, which was heartbreaking for Gramps because he comes from uh, a brass background, and uh, he was hoping that I'd play trumpet or trombone, but I came in with a, I think it was actually a clarinet at first. I ended up moving over toward to a saxophone, but... Uh, he wasn't as fond about woodwinds, especially from beginners, because there's a lot of squeaky sounds that happen that are that are not the, the best on your ears. But anyways, he put that that clarinet. I put the had the clarinet in my hands, or in the I had the mouthpiece in my mouth, but he twisted it to where it the mouthpiece was facing the way that it should be for me. But he was able to hold it and play it. And he was like, all right, now he showed me how to put my mouth on it and, and how to blow into it. And he's just like, all right, I want you to blow into it. And I, I blew, and he played this, like, super cool scale and everything. And for a second, it was just, like, I had to stop. I had to stop playing because I was laughing. It was just so much fun. Like, here I am never having played before, and I'm making music, you know, and it was just sounding beautiful. So that was really cool. And the way that he... He had that effect on every student of his, and he, you know, he, he taught for, he was the band director for the National Guard for over 30 years, and then after he got out of that, he taught middle school band for, for a long time, and uh, that's just what he did. He made people fall in love with music, and whether it be playing and singing uh, or, you know, playing a, an instrument as a part of a bigger band, being in a a choir or, or whatever. If you're making music, he just he re, he showed people how much fun it could be to to make music, and that was what he lived by. I mean, he just he uh, was a born teacher, and uh, he 
he he caused. I, I don't I don't I think you'd be hard pressed to find a student of his that wasn't able to fall in love with music, and so that was the the coolest thing about him is that he just you know showed so many people how how cool music really could be and making making playing music that's already done and making your own music it's just it's a beautiful thing. And last one, where you said I've still got some road to travel as a writer. How do you actively work on that? So, what did you mean when you said that at the time? And how do you actively work to develop writing and to learn? I mean, you know, writing with people like Chris and Frank probably helps. Yeah. Um, yeah. That. Well, uh, as uh, and Liv, you talked about this earlier. Um, when a, a professional, or a, not a professional, but a uh, Somebody that works, I don't feel like you can ever stop learning. You're never going to master something that you do. If it's a career or a passion that you have, you can always learn something from it. And so continue to learn. And so that's what I've, uh, that's what I meant, you know, by, by saying that. There's, there's some, some stuff that I've, I've done that I'm, you know, really proud of. And I'm, uh, I definitely don't have any, uh, regrets or, uh, anything like that. But there's, you know, I, I still feel like there's a lot that I have to learn, especially getting in the room and writing with, with uh, a lot of the guys around around town up here. But, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like there's a lot of stuff that I can come up with on my own, and just about the time when I feel really confident I'll step in with somebody else and just, it's like another door is open and I realize how much I don't know and like how how much better other people are. And not that it's a thing about who's better than who or whatever. I, I feel like there's a lot of people that can bring a, a lot of things to the table. And that's the beauty of co-writes is you can kind of come up with those things together. The things that you say can spark interest in other people and make them think of other things too. Uh, but just as, you know, as a songwriter in general, I... I uh, there, there's a lot, a lot more that I have uh, yet to learn, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm totally cool with that. You know, I, I, I like to, uh, I like to learn, and I, I like to get better. And the more that, the more that I do it, you know, the, obviously the better I'll get, and uh, hopefully I can continue doing it for a long time. And that's another thing too. Like, as a songwriter, it's not like you can get too old to write a song or, you know, don't have the, the energy to, to show up anymore and do it. You can write a song laying in bed if you want to. So hopefully I'll be doing it for a long time. <laughs>